You're listening to The Jacob Volk Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Volk. Here he is, Jacob Volk. Of the Jacob Volk Show, I am Jacob Volk, and this is probably going to be a shorter show. Firstly, the Yankees start at 1 o'clock today, and I want to watch them. Secondly... I gave you a show this morning, the New York Jets draft preview. Go listen to it if you haven't already. And thirdly, not a lot happened in the sports world last night. We're all waiting with bated breath to see what happens with the NFL draft. More specifically, we're waiting to see what happens with the third overall pick. That's where the fun starts. We know the Jaguars are going to take Lawrence. We know the Jets are going to take Wilson. Which quarterback are the Niners going to take? It should be Justin Fields. That's what I would do if I was Kyle Shanahan or John Lynch, whoever has the final say with the Niners. I wouldn't bang tables if it was Trey Lance. I'll say this, though. Before the NFL draft, ESPN does a mock draft with their beat writers from all 32 teams. When the Niners beat writer got on the clock, he took Mac Jones with the third overall pick. That wasn't him saying that he thought Jones was the third best quarterback in this draft. That was him saying, based on his connections within the San Francisco 49ers, that's what he thinks they're going to do. And I've spoken about the possibility of the Niners taking Jones. I think it would be criminal. People love his ability to throw from the pocket. I think Kyle Trask is a much better pocket passer than Mac Jones. I don't like Mac Jones. I think he's going to bust. I don't think he's going to have a long career. Well, let me rephrase. He'll last a while because he'll be a solid backup. You'll be able to put him in when you need to, and he won't embarrass himself, but... As a franchise quarterback, a starting quarterback, no, he is not long for that role. And in that same mock draft, Justin Fields fell to 15. And Kevin Nagandi, who hosted the special, said that he wanted Fields to go to the Patriots because every fan base in the NFL would go nuts. He's right. If Justin Fields ends up slipping to the Patriots at 15, I'm going to go nuts. If they trade up, okay. You know, you can't control that. But if he actually slips to the Patriots, they don't need to trade up for him. He just falls in their lap. Oh, I'm going to go nuts. So look, it's going to be a fun night. Love watching the draft. Absolutely obsessed with it. You know this. But before we get there, there are some things that I need to talk about. 
specifically Red Sox Mets. A rematch of the 1986 World Series. The Red Sox swept the Mets. On Tuesday, they beat them 2-1. to one. And yesterday, despite Jacob deGrom having another outstanding start, where he pitched six innings, only gave up three hits, struck out nine, only allowed one walk, only gave up one run, the Mets lost one nothing. You want to talk about the prototypical Jacob deGrom outing? That's the prototypical deGrom outing. He pitches fantastic, gives the Mets an excellent chance to win. They just can't give him any blasted run support. DeGrom has struck out 59 batters in his first five starts. That ties Nolan Ryan's record for most strikeouts by a starter in his first five outings of the season. His ERA ballooned from .31 to .51. It went up two-tenths of a run. Oh my goodness! Trade him now while he still has some value! <laughs> I just don't get it. I don't understand why the Mets can't hit for Jacob deGrom. Do you know how many wins Jacob deGrom has in his last four seasons when he took the jump from good to great? 27. That's it. In four seasons. I understand you have the 60-game season in there. But in 2020, he only had four wins. He started 12 games. 27 wins in four seasons. That's less than seven a year from one of the best pitchers in baseball. I don't understand it. The Yankees, about seven years ago, had a pitcher by the name of Ivan Nova. Nova was not a good pitcher. But the Yankees, for some reason, always hit for him. In 2012, he finished with a 5.02 ERA. Think about what his win-loss record should be. And mind you, he started 28 games that year. His record that year was 12-8. and eight. He had a winning record with a 5.02 ERA. For some reason, the Yankees just always hit for him. I don't understand it. They made him look a lot better than he actually was. He got an average of five runs of support every game he started in 2014. Jacob deGrom is the anti-Ivan Nova. Nova was an extremely lucky pitcher. Jacob deGrom is the unluckiest person to ever pick up a baseball. How many wins do you think this guy should have? In his career, at least a hundred, right? His career record right now is seventy-two and fifty-three. He should have at least a hundred wins, right? Some of those losses should be wins. Some no decisions should be wins. Let's say a hundred. I think that's a fair estimate. We'd be talking about this guy possibly finishing his career with the best win-loss percentage in baseball history. 
Instead, forget about it. He's not even going to sniff that leaderboard. All-time wins, forget about it. Wins by a Met? No way. At this very moment, Bobby Jones has more wins in a Mets uniform than Jacob deGrom. All due respect to Bobby Jones. Solid pitcher. Had a good career. Won a pennant with the Mets. Made an all-star team with the Mets. Jacob deGrom is a million times better than him. I mean, let me tell you. If I was DeGrom, I'd be really frustrated with the Mets. You go out and make these big moves to fortify the lineup. You sign James McCann. You trade for Francisco Lindor. Both of those guys are useless right now. Jeff McNeil is useless. Dominic Smith is useless. Michael Conforto is useless. The New York Mets have scored the least number of runs of any team in Major League Baseball. Now, I know that that's a little misleading because the Mets have only played 19 games and other teams have played 24. But let's take a team like the Washington Nationals. Let's narrow it to the National League because in all teams, the Tigers have scored the second least number of runs in Major League Baseball. The Mets have five games in hand on the Tigers. It's not fair to compare them. Let's compare the Mets to the Nationals. The Mets have played 19 games. The Nationals have played 21 games. You know how many runs the Nationals have scored? 75. You know how many runs the Mets have scored? 57. The New York Mets aren't scoring 18 runs in their next two games. They're not going to tee off on the Phillies like that. Let me tell you. This was supposed to be a great Mets lineup. It hasn't turned out that way in the first month of the season. And if I'm DeGrom, I'm getting ticked off. I'm not saying that he feels this way. We all know that he says all the right things. I think he really likes being a Met. But DeGrom isn't a youngster anymore. He's 32. He's going to turn 33 on June 19th. He's got to start thinking about his legacy. This guy's going to be lucky to finish his career with 150 wins. If he was on any other team, he'd be shooting for 200 wins. You combine that with the strikeouts and the two Cy Youngs, He's a surefire Hall of Famer, but can we put in a pitcher with 150 wins in the Hall of Fame? I mean, come on. Oh, but Jacob, wins don't matter, blah, blah, blah. No, for the Hall of Fame, wins matter. That's how you evaluate pitchers all time. It's not ERA. If it was ERA, Ed Walsh would be regarded as the greatest pitcher in baseball history. He's not. I'm not knocking Walsh, he's a Hall of Famer, but he's not in that conversation for best pitcher ever. You know who is in that conversation? Cy Young, Walter Johnson, Grover Alexander... And Christy Mathewson. Those are the four all-time wins leaders. If I was a pitcher, I'd want wins. Again, 
this is me. This is me knowing myself. And I'm not saying this as a Mets hater. If I was a starting pitcher with the talent of Jacob DeGrom, I'd say to my team, you guys need to start winning for me. This is ridiculous. If not, I want out. 27 wins in the last four seasons. Counting this season that just started and the 60-game season. 21 wins in his two Cy Young years. He had a 553 winning percentage. 21 and 17. Let me tell you, if DeGrom was on the 2018 Yankees, would he have ever lost the game? Could he have gone 20-0? The 2018 Yankees were offensive juggernauts. We all know this. You put DeGrom on that team, there's a chance he could go 20-0. He'd definitely have 20 wins. Maybe he'd have one loss. Maybe two. I don't know. But if you put him on any other team in 2018, he's a 20-game winner. If you put him on any other team now, he's a 20-game winner. When we evaluate pitchers for the Hall of Fame, we look at wins and strikeouts. Maybe we look at stuff like Cy Young's all-star games, and postseason success. But for the most part, it's wins and strikeouts. It's not ERA. If it was ERA, Billy Wagner would be in the Hall of Fame right now. Thank God he's not. I mean, DeGrom is at 1,418 strikeouts right now. He led the National League in strikeouts in 2019 and last year. He's leading the majors in strikeouts right now. Can he get a 1,000 more strikeouts? You're asking him to get 200 strikeouts per year through his age 38 season. That's tough. If you combine it with wins, it's a Hall of Fame career, but... Without the wins, it's tough. Will DeGrom get into the Hall of Fame? Probably. But I don't think he's a slam dunk Hall of Famer. I don't see him pushing Mariano, Jeter, Griffey, and Seaver in terms of total vote percentage. I mean, I don't want to hear that multiple Cy Youngs get you into the Hall of Fame. Tim Lincecum has two Cy Youngs. He's not getting into the Hall of Fame. Corey Kluber has two Cy Youngs. He's not getting into the Hall of Fame. Brett Saberhagen has two Cy Youngs. He's not getting into the Hall of Fame. If the Grom wins one more, sure. But is he going to do it again? I don't know. He's off to a great start. There's no question. But we've got a lot of baseball left to play. All in all, the Mets should be absolutely ashamed of how they failed to support one of the best pitchers of this era in DeGrom. DeGrom's a lot better of a sport than me because if I was him, I'd want out. If you're not going to win for me and you keep giving me losses that I don't deserve, I want out. I want to win ball games. I want to play for World Series. Not just one. I'd have requested a trade a long time ago. Mets fans should thank their lucky stars that they have a guy like DeGrom with his temperament. He has the patience of a saint. It doesn't get talked about enough. 
We talk about the fact that the Mets don't score for him, but we don't talk about how it probably makes DeGrom feel. Yeah, he says all the right things, but deep down, this guy at this point in his career should have 100 wins. He only has 72. That's incredibly wrong on a million different levels. All right, now I'll give you some NBA Vogue talk. And the 76ers clinched their playoff berth yesterday in very convincing fashion. They annihilated the Hawks 127 to 83. Talk about a game that you could turn off in the first quarter. At the end of one, the Sixers were up 20. At one point, the Sixers had a 46-point lead. They ended up winning by 44. I mean, it's incredible. The Hawks were beyond dreadful. I understand that they were incredibly short-handed. But guys, you're fighting for a playoff spot. You're fighting with the Knicks right now for home court advantage. That's the performance you put out there? I don't care that Trey Young was out. I don't care that Reddish was out, Hunter, Snell, Bogdanovich, and Herter. It's irrelevant. You can't lose by 44 points. I mean, obviously, this was an incredibly convincing win for the Sixers. The biggest thing that stands out to me is their spacing. Adding Seth Curry and Danny Green just adds a whole new element to their offense, something that they were missing last year. Furkan Korkmaz has really stepped up. Obviously, they still have Simmons and Bede and Harris. They're going to be a tough out. There is no team in the Eastern Conference that I fear more as a Nets fan than the Sixers. I fear the Knicks because of their stifling defense. I fear the Celtics. Because they do have star power. Not as much as the Nets, but Tatum, Brown, and Kemba Walker is a pretty good big three. And I fear the Heat because of their defense. But I don't fear any of those teams as much as I fear the Sixers. It seems like a Nets-Sixers Eastern Conference Finals is inevitable. I don't know who's going to have home court advantage at this very moment. The Nets have a one-game lead on the Sixers. But regardless of whether the Game 7 is played at the Barclays Center or the Wells Fargo Center, it's going to be a fantastic series. There was another team in the NBA that clinched a playoff berth, albeit in not as much convincing fashion, but still, it's noteworthy. That, of course, is the Phoenix Suns. They beat the Clippers 109-101 to and are in the playoffs for the first time in 11 years. To put that into perspective... Their two best players, Steve Nash and Amari Stoudemire, are both Nets coaches right now. You know, we're not taking the Suns seriously, and I don't get it. I don't expect them to go on a huge run in the playoffs. If the season ended today, the Suns would face the Blazers in the first round. They'd beat the Blazers. It would be a tough series because 
Lillard and McCollum would do Lillard and McCollum things, but the Suns would win it. Then they'd go up against the Clippers. I don't care that they just beat the Clippers 109 to 101. I don't see the Suns beating the Clippers in a seven game series. Realize yesterday, Kawhi Leonard, Patrick Beverly, and Serge Ibaka didn't play. Those guys are all going to play in the playoffs. So while I congratulate the Suns on what they've done, DeAndre Ayton has established himself as one of the best young big men in the NBA. Devin Booker is one of the best young players in the NBA. And Chris Paul has been a perfect fit for the Suns. Monty Williams should be coach of the year. I just don't see them making a lot of noise in the playoffs. I'm putting them on upset alert. All right, now I'll give you some NHL vault talk. And the Toronto Maple Leafs clinched a playoff berth of their own. Beat the Canadians 4-1. to And are firmly in first place in the North Division. Guess who started that game for the Leafs? Jack Campbell. Guess who should start going forward? Jack Campbell. Campbell. How many times have I said that? I don't want to see any Leafs goalie start whose name isn't Jack Campbell unless there's a back-to-back. The guy is absolutely taking a stranglehold of the Leafs starting goalie job. Austin Matthews scored his 35th goal of the year in spectacular fashion. Batted the puck out of midair with his stick. And then a second later, sniped it by Jake Allen. It was an incredible goal. Seek it out on YouTube or Twitter if you haven't seen it already. Look, the Leafs are a scary team. They have an offense capable of taking over games. Am I sold on their defense? No, I haven't been sold on their defense all year. But with Campbell and Nett and this fantastic offense that has Mitch Marner, Matthews, John Tavares, William Nylander, and Zach Hyman... I understand that Hyman's hurt right now, but he's going to be back for the playoffs. The Leafs can go on a very deep playoff run. Moving on now to Avalanche Golden Knights. The Knights beat the Avalanche pretty convincingly last night, 5-2. to two. William Carlson scored a goal 10 seconds into the game. Less than a minute into the third period, Max Pacioretty scored a goal. Those were two tough goals to give up. You could sense that momentum changed when Devin Dubnik let those two goals by him. The Golden Knights right now are the hottest team in hockey. It's not even close. They've won their last 10 straight. At this very moment, they have the most points in the NHL. Robin Lehner and Marc-Andre Fleury have been fantastic. During this streak, the Golden Knights have only given up Three goals once. And it was at the start of the streak. A 7-4 win over the Coyotes on the ninth. 
Not to be outdone, though, their offense has been fantastic. The only game during this streak that they've scored less than three goals was the second win against the Coyotes. That was April 11th. They won one nothing. You know how many shots they gave up in that game? 14. Absolutely incredible. Their penalty kill has been outstanding as it's been all year. Their power play is rounding into form after being a black hole for the whole season. Max Pacioretty is having a career renaissance. Mark Stone is doing an excellent job in setting up his teammates. The Golden Knights are a really scary team right now. You've heard the saying, you don't want to face a hot goalie. You don't want to face a hot team. I don't want to hear this nonsense that they're peaking too soon. No. They put themselves in prime position to nab the one seed in the West Division. They've shown that they can beat every team in their division convincingly. They're going to have to face two of them if they want to get to the Stanley Cup Finals again. At this very moment, there is no team that I want to go up against less than the Vegas Golden Knights. The team that I want to go up against the most is the New York Islanders. I'm not going to go too in-depth on them. I'll save that for Monday. You're going to get an Islanders show on Monday night. You know that. But my God, this team is ticking me off. The Islanders are playing the Rangers tonight at the Garden. If the Islanders lose in regulation, they will only be three points up on the Rangers. Bear in mind that the Rangers are the five seed. Like I said, I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole. Tomorrow, you're probably going to get my recap of the first round of the NFL Draft. I doubt I'll do anything else. Don't quote me on that. I just don't see anything else earth-shattering happening in the sports world in the next 24 hours. Until then, I am Jacob Valk saying that spring is the time of year when the ground thaws, trees bud, your income tax comes due, and everybody wins the pennant.